Wave AI. My name is Devashish Paul, CEO and founder of Blue Wave AI. Uh, I'd like to thank all the audience and panelists for joining us today for our fourth in our Global Energy Transition Summit focused on electrification of transport and the key building blocks to make all of that happen. We have presenters today from Alaska Airlines who run electric fleets in terms of their ground operations, Proterra buses, MB Transit who runs transit in 200 cities, in 200 cities, sorry about that, in, in 200 cities with 11,000 buses. And we have um, Area XO, uh, Kelly Days, who's the director of Area XO will talk to you about the autonomous vehicle test bed that they have set up in Ottawa, Canada with EVs, with charging, with 5G communications and the path to how to scale that out globally. Uh, Lori Hydro, the Director of Distribution of Hydro Ottawa. And uh, finally, closing marks at the end uh, from Sonia Shori. So uh, to get things kicked off, uh, I will introduce uh, Minister Catherine McKenna. She's our Canadian Minister of Infrastructure. And uh, Catherine, uh, uh, you might get one of the most unique uh, uh, um, introductions today. So uh, Catherine McKenna uh, used to, uh, in our past cabinet, was our Minister of Environment. And prior to that, before she was elected in the 2015 election, uh, legend has it that she walked door to door to 100,000 100, doors. And uh, out of the 100,000 doors, she secured 38,000 votes. Now, I'm the CEO of a data-driven AI company. So I was looking at that data and 38,000 out of 100,000 is, uh, is a batting average of, of 380. And I looked at all of Major League Baseball in all time. And in the modern era, Tony Gwynn in 1994, who's a Hall of Famer, got a batting average of 394. No one's broken 400. And Larry Walker, a Canadian, did it in 1999, I believe. He batted 379, Catherine. So your effort was along the lines of the top MLB Hall of Famers. But with that, I want to hand it over to Catherine McKenna, uh, who's toiled tirelessly and put her neck out and enabled the energy transition here in Canada and around the world today as Minister of Infrastructure trying to drive the electrification of transport. Over to you, Catherine. Of course, I started off on mute because that wouldn't be a proper Zoom event if someone didn't do it. So now everyone else, you're fine. I did it. Um, thanks, uh, Devishish. Uh, it's amazing uh, to be here. Uh, speaking about a talk topic I care so much about, um, which is electrifying transportation. Um, thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not a baseball player. I'm a competitive swimmer, but don't worry. I'm always driving to win. <laughs> and uh, I think we need to win uh, it, on climate, both in terms of uh, the thing is the thing and the thing is climate change and, and we will get out of this pandemic uh, and we will still have the climate crisis and we owe it to future generations to win, but also the huge economic opportunity, the innovation, um, the opportunity to have cleaner air, um, but good companies with good jobs, I think is just so incredibly important. Um, I uh, want to start by recognizing I'm on the traditional territory uh, of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. I'm also in my home. So you may see a child or a dog, you never know what's gonna happen, uh, hopefully not. Um, I also wanna start by, welcoming, by wishing everyone happy World Environment Week. Uh, I started the week with green hair, it is no longer green, but I'm still in the spirit of World Environment Week. Um, and uh, a, a huge welcome to everyone who's joining us, but also, of course, to the amazing folks that are participating. Um, it's great to see all the innovation um, in this space. It's great, of course, to see Ottawa companies. I'm also the member of Parliament for Ottawa Centre, so go Ottawa in the transition, um, but also companies uh, that are operating around the world and of course our U.S. partners. We're very glad that you are there. Um, we're very glad uh, with the Biden uh, administration leadership on climate. I think huge opportunities for Canada and the U.S. to work together. 
Um, this summit is, is so important because uh, as I say, like things don't just happen by accident. Um, I, as former Minister of Environment and Climate Change, I was certainly always bringing my climate lens uh, to all of our infrastructure investments, but hard things are hard. And you have to be very smart about how you do things. You have to look at opportunities and with new technologies like AI, like big data, I think it just provides huge way to rethink how we're doing things to be much more efficient um, and uh, much more effective. Uh, so let's talk about transportation um, in Canada. That's uh, a quarter of our emissions. And so our focus as a government uh, has been electrifying everything generally, but of course, electrifying our transportation system. Um, we have uh, announced historic investments uh, in public transportation, which is obviously part of the solution, uh, including uh, $25 billion uh, since 2015 dedicated to public transit. But we are also in uh, a COVID recession, the greatest recession since the Great Depression, and uh, we need to build back better. And that actually means something. That means making sure that as we invest, every dollar has multiple benefits. Of course, economic growth and jobs has to be top of mind. We've committed to a million jobs, but so is tackling climate change and building resilience. And we need to build more inclusive communities for everyone so that everyone has a chance to succeed as we move to net zero emissions. Um, we have uh, a new $15 billion fund uh, to uh, do quick investments um, in public transit, major projects, but also Canada's first ever zero emission bus fund. We've committed to 5,000 electric buses. I think we need to do way more than that, but 5,000 is pretty ambitious for Canada and we have amazing Canadian companies in that space. Uh, of course, other companies that are represented here too, uh, uh, to be part of the opportunity. We have Canada's first ever active transportation fund because we need to link uh, active transportation. So cycling paths, walking paths, um, foot bridges so that people can actually get to the public transit. In Ottawa, 80% of Ottawans will live within five kilometers of light rail transit. We gotta get them there. Um, we also have our first ever rural transit fund. Um, I tell you this because we're all in and we're looking at all uh, the options that are out there. Uh, we also have uh, the Canada Infrastructure Bank. So later today, I'll be making an announcement um, with the city of Edmonton. They have committed to going uh, zero electric uh, buses. Uh, and, um, and so we are working with them the federal government, but also the Canada Infrastructure Bank so that we can crowd in the private sector. We need more money, not less in the transition and we need to think outside the box. Um, that uh, let's talk about, uh, we just announced a budget um, that includes almost $20 billion towards a green recovery, but to put it into context for American friends, uh, the amount of money that we are investing uh, in a green inclusive recovery is, uh, is on the same level of the US uh, Biden proposed stimulus plan. Um, $250 billion uh, when, you, uh, when you account for our population and uh, for currency, we are already there. So good luck getting your money, but we are already doing this. Not that it's a competition, um, but uh, we, need to, we need to be aiming big uh, as well. And let me talk about Ottawa, because as I say, I'm a proud Ottawan and uh, it's great that we have uh, Invest Ottawa here. Of course, Blue Wave AI being one of our uh, amazing clean tech leading, world leading companies. Um, and uh, Dev, I want to give you guys a shout out because when I look at what Blue Wave AI is doing, it's a huge opportunity for Canada to punch way above its weight. Um, out of Ottawa, like, I love it that you are using AI for so many different applications. We know that we need to have much more efficient grids as we bring on renewables. We're going to have to be very thoughtful to maximize that um, and we've been investing in blue wave AI so keep it going but of course using AI to help with the electrification of transport and maximizing how electric fleets are, are used to reduce emissions um, I think that is a huge opportunity so keep it going uh, we love it um, but we're also doing a lot of other amazing things. Uh, when I look at Invest Ottawa that's represented today uh, as well as Area X.O 
um, we're really reimagining one, how we do things in Ottawa, but how we can be a leader in technology that the whole world needs. That's good jobs. That's economic growth. That's tackling climate change. Um, those are all critically important to us. Um, I was quite, uh, I was quite chuffed to be able to uh, try one of um, the zero emission shuttles uh, that we're testing. Uh, that was pretty cool. Um, very little you can do in a pandemic, but I was <laughs> alone almost in uh, this shuttle. But uh, it just reminded me that the future is here, that we need to, we have the opportunity right now. We're making governments around the world are making significant investments to restart our economy and create good jobs, but also to tackle the biggest challenge and opportunity the world faces, which of course uh, is climate change. So you know what, Ottawa is going to continue to be driving the way. I have set the mark. Ottawa needs to be the greenest capital in the world. We have all the assets um, with the Ottawa River, with lots of natural spaces, with a community that is committed to climate action and protecting the environment and amazing companies leading the way uh, like Blue Wave AI. I'll just leave everyone with this thought. Um, we need to hit zero emissions by 2050. That is not a nice to have, that is a must have. There is a lot of work to be done. It's all hands on deck and we need every solution that is out there um, and some solutions that don't exist. Although we know a lot of the solutions and now we've got to link different opportunities. As I said, AI, big data, to the grid, to the new technologies we're bringing in. So we need you guys to help us drive to net zero emissions and strengthen our economies, creating good jobs and more inclusive, cleaner communities for everyone. So let's do it all together. Um, and I wish you all a really awesome summit. Thanks so much, Catherine. And uh, to your point about uh, you know getting to zero emissions, uh, and since we're talking competitions, I think my next speaker, uh, Diana from Alaska Airlines, who's VP of uh, uh, Sustainability and Government Relations for that airline. Uh, in terms of competition, they have one of the largest electric fleets in the world already. And for the audience who are thinking, wow, you mean like electric airplanes? Are they already flying? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, she'll talk to you a bit about that, but Alaska Airlines has a massive electric fleet on the ground. And Catherine talked about, you know, uh, AI and data enabling these type of applications. Without the data, without uh, uh, the information of how these vehicles are moving around, uh, we can't actually make it more efficient. Uh, Alaska Airlines has 350 electric vehicles already and uh, I won't steal the rest of Diana's thunder, but they are, they're one of the leading airlines around the world on this energy transition. And it's, uh, it's really uh, exciting to have her here talk about how they're single-handedly maybe changing the theme in the aviation industry, which you wouldn't normally think as a industry going on the path to sustainability. So Diana, we'll hand it over to you. Uh, beautiful picture, I think. Uh, is that Mount Rainier or Mount Hood? Is that Seattle or Portland? <clears throat> Mount Rainier. All right, over to you. Well, thank you, Dev. That was a very wonderful, uh, generous introduction. And Minister McKenna, thank you for your inspiring words. And um, a bit of competition is not a bad thing, uh, especially if it is heading us toward um, an energy transition and uh, a better climate environment for our children and beyond. Um, so just, I'll just dive right in. Uh, just to introduce um, myself and, and Alaska Airlines to all of you, if you go to the next slide, we are the fifth largest uh, US airline. Um, I'm afraid we do not currently fly to Ottawa, although that is something that we'll look forward to in the future. We do fly to Western Canada, um, all the, the West Coast. and. You know, if you think about this map in terms of um, climate impact, uh, you know, food security and, um, and land stability up in uh, the Alaskan communities all the way down the West Coast and Hawaii, uh, climate impact is very real. We saw it, we've seen that every year the last few years with the tremendous wildfires in, in California and we are very committed to doing our part to move in the right direction. Um, I will note just on a Canadian front that uh, our CEO grew up in Montreal. So 
uh, and served in the Canadian military. So we have um, strong ties across the border. So if you go to the next slide, um, aviation is one of the most tremendously difficult sectors to decarbonize. So I appreciate being at the front of this agenda and um, sort of maybe being able to seed a few challenges here and some opportunities. And, and Dev, I appreciate your partnership and sort of helping us think about the way forward. Um, so this is, I won't go through this entire uh, graphic. It is online if it's of interest, but there are just so many different places that we have climate impact. And that's what this is intended to illustrate. We burn 750 million gallons of fuel a year. And in getting people from one place to another, we inherently burn uh, jet fuel. And so the challenge for us is how do you eliminate the need to burn and how do you replace that with a lower emissions, lower carbon life cycle alternative. In our ground services equipment, as Dev said, we're currently 34% electric ground services equipment. That's belt loaders, tugs, all the vehicles on the, air, on the um, airport floor and uh, lots of opportunity to continue moving in the right direction there. So we've set some goals for ourselves. If you go to the next slide, we have set a course um, to uh, get to net zero by 2040. And we've got a five part path that I'll share with you. However, we know that the interim milestones to get there are really critical. So working kind of back up the, state, the slide, for 2025, we and other airlines are intending to maintain carbon neutral growth. Alaska has set our sights on being the most fuel efficient US airline that's working every bit of waste out of the system so that we can reduce our emissions. And specifically for ground services equipment, cl cutting climate emissions in half. So that is the electric fleet, um, the lower emissions fleet on the ground that Dev spoke of. And because every year matters, we have actually integrated a carbon efficiency uh, metric into our annual incentive pay program for every single one of our employers, employees starting this year. How much carbon per um, essentially seat that we put into the market, airplane seat, and trying to get that down every year. So if you go to the next slide, how do we do this? It is an incredibly difficult challenge to think about how to get to net zero. And just to be honest, that's 19 years. We don't know every step of the way. But what we've done is look at the current environment, the current um, trajectory of technology change, policy, et cetera, and made some calculated assumptions about what we believe the fraction of each of these five parts will be to get us to net zero with credible carbon offsets being the last resort. The underlying sort of foundation is operational efficiency. And that includes things like electric tugs, belt loaders, all of the things that we use within the operation our ground vehicles and moving those toward electric with the right infrastructure to support them over time to get every bit of waste out of, of, of excess um, uh, carbon out of the system. It also includes flight operations, route optimization, other things. Evolving our fleets, the next one, sustainable aviation fuel, and then you get to novel propulsion, which essentially is the emerging technology to allow, and we believe in the next 20 years, our regional aircraft. So the smaller aircraft, maybe 72, 50 to 72 seats to get toward electric. That's farther off than electric vehicles, but it is something we have our sights on and something that we want to achieve. And then finally, carbon, uh, carbon offsets, credible carbon offsets to close the gap. So to the last slide, what do we need to do to get in this direction? And this is just to sort of seed future conversation. Every single one of these things matters. Manufacturing, certain things like de-icing trucks, which are very necessary up in Alaska and um, in other parts of the West Coast, including here in Seattle, don't currently come um, in available electric form. So making sure that those are available infrastructure needs, data to track and manage our fleet so that we're using it effectively and getting it to the right charging infrastructure, training, et cetera. A couple challenges and opportunities that I'll throw out there. We operate from the Arctic to you know, the desert and we have to have uh, battery powered um, vehicles that will work in all of those environments with the right infrastructure. And so that's sort of the operational reliability test for us is making sure that the electric vehicles are strong enough and durable enough to withstand that environmental um, variation. On a policy front, 
a lot of opportunity there. We do need a little bit more of a kickstart. Um, however, Senator Cantwell, Senator from um, our great state of Washington, just introduced last week uh, a bill called the FAST uh, Electricity Act, which will offer a 30% investment credit for moving toward electric vehicles in all areas of transportation. Um, so there's a lot of challenge, there's a lot of opportunity. I really look forward to learning from all of uh, my colleagues here on the panel about what they're doing in other parts of transportation. Um, so Dev, hope that just kind of tees things up and back over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. I, it's June 3rd and you were talking about de-icing. So here in Ottawa, I think we're on our third de-ice day of the year and the sun is finally out. Um, but, uh, you know, all joking aside, thank you. And thank you for your leadership uh, in the aviation industry, but also actually setting the stage uh, for the likes of municipal transport catching up. You do have a, an advantage in that you control what happens inside your airport hubs. Uh, whereas uh, Jim, who will speak next, he's the, um, uh, he's the CIO of uh, MV Transit, operating 11,000 buses in, uh, uh, in 200 cities around the US and Canada does not have exactly the same luxury as, uh, as, as Diana. I say luxury, Diana, because uh, you, you kind of control your hub. Jim does not control the st streets in the city. Um, he's gonna share his view on electrification and how they move along this path. And it, and it sounds like in the state of Washington, you just got an opening with a 30% credit, uh, uh, Jim, to uh, to go and deploy a whole bunch of buses there. So over to you, Jim. Yeah, no, thanks, Dev. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, that's a tough to follow, Diana, really inspirational what's going on at Alaska Airlines. Uh, but who is, is MV? You can see we're the largest privately owned uh, contracting firm in the U.S. We are family owned, very proud of that. And we really lead in um, and, and access. We provide fixed route, public and private, but really paratransit and equal access is where we've got our roots and it's still where we're known today. We serve over 110 million passengers. Uh, we support over 200, you saw those numbers. But when you think about that, you, you know, we, we're the company that brings it all together. And every day when you go to your bus stop and at two o'clock, the bus is there and you get on the bus for a fixed route, but really in paratransit uh, to Dev to your point, we have a logistical challenge every 24 hours. Every 24 hours, our schedule is different. We have to have the right number of operators in the right number of places with the right number of vehicles accounting for weather and for traffic. And people count on us to simply be where they need to be on time and to be safe. That's why we're really proud to be named the industry's safest operator. Um, you, the, first and foremost, you wanna be on time, but first and foremost, you wanna be safe. So uh, we take great pride in what we do in that area, but also we need to drive innovation. So uh, as we move forward, how do we think about electrification, zero emissions, obviously being in the US and Canada, um, you know, we, we joked, I was joking with a colleague recently that said, hey, I think we should start a reality TV show that goes something like this and says, hey, so I bought an EV bus, now what should I do? So there's no end of small, small companies, private companies that are trying to do a pilot or I want to get into this space or I got a grant and I just got two vehicles. And, and the, first thing, the first thing we're seeing is we, this more so than ever, you've got to make a plan for five to 10 years to get on that journey. Sure, you can do a pilot, you can look at a vehicle, but we're seeing no end of, no end of you know, false starts. You know, I bought a bus, I bought this size battery, I had a direct charger. And next thing I know, I, I don't have enough capacity to charge my vehicle overnight for the morning. And then my bus can only run for four hours during the day. So I think it's similar to uh, Diane's theme. This is a new ecosystem and no company has all the right answers yet, but it has to start with short and long-term planning for years in the current, you know, you can buy 10 new buses, start a new route, get some operators and, and get on your way and, and have some new service on the road. Road, that's going to change. And you really have to make a thoughtful plan over the entire journey. We think about the change in operational complexity because some parts of you go, okay, it's just a bus and somebody drives it. But to your point, you have to think about public infrastructure now and where are my charging locations? So first you have to, how, how, far, can, how far can my bus go? 
uh, number one, but then you have to think how far away is that from my, my, my closest charger? So rather than today, the strategy would be more like, how do I get a single vehicle out there with an operator that can have the maximum mileage? We may have to send out more operators with more vehicles that can only ever go, you know, say more than 20 miles from the, the closest charger. So that changes the whole ecosystem of how we create a daily schedule. Again, in our paratransit service, every 24 hours, we create a different schedule based on ridership needs. So so that operational complexity is going to be huge and, again, requires a thoughtful plan. And no single company has all the answers to these. That's why we have partnerships with great companies like Dev at Blue Wave AI, trying to bring all that information together. Uh, vehicle availability. I think uh, you heard some of that. Our partners are here from Proterra, but we're really looking for new vehicle availability in that accessibility space. There's starting to be some early entrants. That's a, that's a space we care deeply about, and we're really looking to see the market start to flood and get into that space because we think uh, there's just huge opportunity there for that. Uh, how do I train operators? I mean, one of the things we're seeing post-pandemic, they're starting to be a driver shortage already. How do I track those, that next generation of operators into this space and how do I train them? So, you know, generally you can say, well, an electric vehicle is similar, but the propulsion is different. The way we want them to drive to maximize energy is different. Um, so that'll be a new way of training. But even our mechanics, when I think about our mechanics, uh, a guy in our shop jokes, he says, hey, I've trained mechanics, not electricians. And frankly, if, if you do the wrong thing on an EV bus, you actually, you can start a fire and you can take your life into your own hands. So that is a new level of safety that we have to consider. Um, and repairing those vehicles. I think our partners like Proterra and some of the others would say, when right now there's a shortage of people that know how to repair these vehicles. And, and what the OEMs are saying a lot to us is, man, a lot of times I have to fly on site and go physically repair the bus because there's just not local trained staff. So the, the training, attracting the next generation of talent, and uh, you can even see there in our picture to the right, uh, this has given us a great opportunity to introduce augmented reality technology, a way for us to just virtually engage hands-free with an OEM and say, hey, let me just show you the problem with the bus and maybe you can stay in this safe of your facility and help me repair it. So we're excited about opportunities like that, but it's in the early days and uh, what I call the data deluge. Uh, Dev, I think this is where companies like yours are really coming in. These vehicles are so connected. We're gonna have more information than ever, but with more information needs, we have to make sense of that data. We need information around charging status. We need information about energy consumption, demand charges, managing your demand charges and peak charging time is just going to become so critical as the fleets evolve. I mean, when you have five or 10 vehicles in the fleet, that's one thing, but uh, we're partnered with the city of Los Angeles, the largest electric vehicle purchase ever. And, and as they scale up, this is going to become really important. And if you get it wrong, we will leave passengers stranded. So just again, becoming so important that we use that data in a way that maintains that efficient operation. And then finally, financing has been, I think uh, the minister talked about, certainly there's a lot of federal subsidies coming out, but I think for the first time in probably the last five years, they're starting to be a path to an ROI between federal subsidies, plus the cost is coming down for the vehicles, and then the infrastructure is starting to build. You can start to see over three, five, seven years now how, there, how you can be neutral and maybe even get a return on your initial investment. But I think our message, similar to Diana, this, this is a new world that takes a new ecosystem of partners because nobody has all the right answers, and we're looking forward to the journey. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Dev. Thanks. My turn to be on mute. Okay, so thank, thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, I think uh, the complexity of deploying these EV fleets in, uh, you know, in that many cities moving forward uh, is not straightforward for a company uh, like MV and the, the ones who crack that nut. And I think Diana's gonna be doing the same thing uh, with Alaska Airlines and multiple hubs around the US with uh, different, uh, regulatory and time of use pricing and so on, all of those things uh, uh, make it much more complex uh, deploying these technologies uh, as you scale them out over geographies. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Alan Westenskog from Proterra, who's uh, the director of business development there. They, uh, they're, they're giving us uh, the tools to, to make this whole thing happen. When Minister McKenna says, you know, we're going to put 5,000 electric buses on the road. Uh, companies like Allen have to, uh, you know, basically create these computers that move people around 
and uh, get them in the hands of the likes of, uh, of, of Jim at MV and others, municipal trans transport authorities, and uh, get them to reliably deliver uh, passengers in a, as cheap a manner as possible with the lowest emissions. So over to you, Alan. Thanks, Dev. A uh, great presentation so far from Diana and Jim. I think seeing different stakeholders' perspectives on this, Diana as uh, 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 a service provider who is trying to integrate electric vehicles and seeing the challenges, but also setting goals because it takes leadership uh, to do these things. It doesn't happen on its own. Uh, and, uh, and making those investments. And then Jim did a great job outlining uh, some of the new operational challenges that are a little bit different than just operating a diesel bus. So uh, Proterra is the manufacturer of, and I said the leading manufacturer of North America of heavy duty um, uh, electric buses and, uh, and other heavy duty vehicles. And what you'll see here is we're, we're trying to develop the product that makes uh, from a reliability standpoint and from an operational standpoint, as easy as possible to be able to help meet all these goals that are being set and make it as efficient and uh, least expensive. So I just want to start off by just giving you some sense of where the market is. We're hearing people give goals and uh, uh, we heard uh, about a joint announcement with Edmonton coming up. Edmonton actually has an enormous fleet in uh, Canada, one of the largest in North America actually uh, deployed right now of electric buses. And what we're seeing when you look at the market, uh, this is overall, but just give you some idea. Uh, right here, you can see uh, European, North American, medium duty and expectations. This is the overall market, 74% uh, by 2040, 90% um, uh, for European uh, by 2040 and uh, North American heavy duty is 30%. Now that's a big, that's a lot of different vehicles. That includes off-road, backhoes, it could include buses, it could include any number of things. The bus sector that we'll talk about is even higher. It's probably the fastest growing conversion uh, because it makes so much sense economically. So just wanna give you a sense of what's going on in the market that I don't think there's any turning back on this because it makes so much sense. So uh, uh, next slide, please. So what Proterra does, uh, we, are, we have an integrated technology ecosystem where really we're able to offer an optimized product offering. And in the, in the middle there, you'll see this is actually a battery. If you ever wonder what a big giant battery looks like, this is it. It actually kind of has the shape uh, and dimensions of, uh, of, a, of a mattress, uh, of actually a twin size mattress. You can imagine that a little bit thinner and a little bit longer, but that's about what it looks like. And it just happens to be the right space to put under a vehicle. Now, what Proterra has done is uh, on the bottom there, you can see the uh, transit bus. This is the core market we've started and we've been delivering transit buses for 10 years. It's a purpose-built vehicle. It's the only purpose-built transit bus in North America uh, versus taking a diesel bus and putting batteries on it. So we've, built, we've uh, got over, I think, 1,200 orders to date uh, and uh, more than half of those deployed with customers. Uh, and that's 130 plus customers in 43 uh, provinces and states. Uh, then on the right side, what happened was Proterra was uh, delivering these vehicles and uh, in the process, we developed our own battery and we had other types of vehicles and manufacturers who wanted to deploy our technology. And so I'll, I'll go into some more detail in a minute, but you can really see nearly every type of medium duty and heavy duty vehicle now is using a Proterra battery. Uh, and then the other piece we identified is the energy piece that uh, your bus is only as good as your charging infrastructure and your ability to manage that and manage the energy because which is what a lot of the work that Dev is focused on is how do you manage this, uh, this information? Because you can uh, do this in a smart way or a less smart way. Uh, meaning specifically that you, know, you can save, we think up to 50% on your capital and operating costs, depending on how you charge and if you're doing it the right way or not. So this is what Proterra offers. Again, it's the bus as the actual vehicle, the entire vehicle. And then we offer uh, the battery for everything else and then the energy solution for the, for the charging infrastructure. Next slide. So this gives you a sense of kind of the different approach we take with these different types of vehicles. So you can see these are the core uh, electrification components that you need on a vehicle. So uh, on the top on our transit and then uh, with Daimler, uh, Thomas School Buses in the United States, we offer uh, really everything. It's the battery system, the EV components, the high voltage systems and controls and the drivetrain on all those. And then you can see down the line, uh, different partners off, uh, require different components from Proterra. They all, of course, use the battery, but you can see uh, the different companies who have done their diligence and said Proterra is the company we want to work with to put their battery system on to make our vehicles work. 
And uh, we're excited because we think that there's a right way and a wrong way to develop a battery. Don't ever let somebody tell you that all batteries are the same. It's not true in terms of engineering, in terms of energy density, and in terms of safety. So we've taken all those designs and really built a purpose-built heavy-duty battery on that. Next slide. And uh, again, the, one of the key points that I want to point out here, you can, I, I gave this example a bit earlier, but uh, here on the, on the left here, where it says unmanaged charging model, this is an example of a sample 43 bus fleet, 45 bus fleet. And the green represents uh, the start and the end of a bus operating in a day. So it leaves the yard and comes back. The blue represents uh, some, uh, you know, an hour long of maintenance when the vehicle gets back in the yard. And then the yellow represents when that vehicle will charge. Now, if you didn't manage this, you just said we're going to charge them all at the same time, you can see down below that would require 45 150 kilowatt chargers, one charger for every vehicle. And you would have a maximum power demand of five megawatts, which is quite a bit. And then you'd have a hypothetical project cost over 12 years, including the cost of electricity, a $17.4 million. And part of that challenge you can see right here is we've got this giant spike every day when we charge all those vehicles and it uh, is going to increase the cost of electricity and the inf infrastructure to deliver it. When you spread it out, when you do, when you're a little bit smarter about this, and this is the thing that's really neat about um, fleet vehicles that leave and come back predictably every day and, and charge in the same place, you can really cut things down. So you can see what we're doing is we're spreading this out. We're flattening that demand curve. You can see right here, it goes from five megawatts to 1.3. And we went from 45 chargers to 12 because we can share the charger when we spread it out. They're not all charging at the same time. And you can see the overall hypothetical project cost went from 17 million down to nine over that 12 year period from both operational costs and capital costs. So. Uh, one thing I, we always want to make sure people understand, number one, the technology exists today to do this. If somebody wants to do this, you can do it right now. Number two, uh, the technology also exists to be able to do this in a way that's less expensive than most of your fossil fuel uh, incumbent uh, technologies, if you just go about it in a smart way. Uh, and so if you have the will to do it, uh, you can get it done. And uh, both the hardware, the equipment, and the software exist and is continued to develop to be able to make this an easy transition. Okay, th thank you, Alan. Um, you know, as Alan mentioned, you know, it, it, uh, it's not so easy as taking a, a uh, existing diesel bus and bolting on an electric battery and magically making things happen. Um, and his last slide actually points out to the grid basically becoming the gas station for those buses and how to manage all of this intelligently. Uh, there's a whole transformation uh, from the equipment all the way up to the business process, all the way to the delivery of uh, transportation uh, to the users of the transportation. And in that vein, our next two speakers uh, will address some of these challenges and some of the things being done to, 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 to deal with that. So Kelly Days is the director of Area XO. And uh, Kelly will uh, tell you a bit about what they're doing in Area XO. In terms of creating the test bed and the networking, that will be the overlay of cities worldwide to enable this electrification transition, uh, gather and use data uh, from vehicles in real time, making the best decisions, both autonomous vehicles as well as driver vehicles um, and use the least amount of carbon footprint. So over to you, Kelly, thank you. Thanks, Dev. Um, we should hire you. You could do our introduction all the time. That was perfect. Thank you. Um, so I, I feel a little different than some of the others um, on the panel in the sense that where we're really playing is in the testing validation and ensuring all of these technologies are future proof. So I, we really do work on an industry led initiative here at Ariax.o, which is operated by Invest Ottawa. And I think uh, very smartly, my marketing team um, has uh, suggested we run a video to really give you a bit of a feel for some of the work that we're doing. And one of the common themes across all of the vert vertical markets that we're uh, enabling is really that carbon footprint thought. So whether it's connected autonomous vehicles, our low speed automated shuttle program or our smart farm initiative, we really look um, very closely at measuring our carbon footprint and being very thoughtful about that. So excited to show you today what we're working on and, um, and fingers crossed, uh, this video will run and everyone will hear audio perfectly. So uh, play video. <laughs> Hi, 
There's a lot of tracks that do testing. There's not a lot of areas where the R&D is happening that leads to the testing. So when we think about what's here, we're not just thinking about cars. We're thinking about military vehicles. We're thinking about first responders that are helping to uh, bring somebody to safety. We're thinking about last mile shuttle services that we can capture the imagination of the public. If you're looking at testing what's coming, that's why you come to AreaX.O. AreaX.O is future ready. AreaX.O operates one of the most advanced communication test infrastructures in the world. Companies in numerous sectors, including smart farming, have access to our GPS systems, 4G LTE, Wi-Fi, LoRaWAN, TV white space, 5G, including millimeter wave, and satellite communication systems. The potential for the Ottawa Area X Auto site is endless, as are smart cities. We are just at the infancy of smart cities. This is just the beginning. I know we're looking at bringing in, you know, trains and rail stations, uh, building a tunnel here. So they're really looking to the future to understand what does a city need to evolve and how can they make that happen here on site. I think the objective for a site like this is to provide a platform where you can test and validate your solution in a, in a contained and controlled environment. Here at AreaX.O, there's a huge array of capabilities and solutions. And one of the biggest challenges we see was how do we get that out to the community? How do we bring in the broader innovation centers across Ontario and Canada? And so with the development of the mobile AreaX.O command center, we can start to do that. We can bring the capabilities right into the local community and start working with small medium businesses there to bring new solutions that address their local needs. We work with the hardware companies, all the big names, the silicon vendors that you can think of, and then we empower these systems. So we're sort of that software foundation that again has to be safe, secure, reliable, 100% of the time. AreaX.O is the futureplex of innovation and collaboration anchored right here in Ottawa, Canada's capital. We enable and accelerate the safe and secure development, testing, and application of future technologies. And we're founded on some of the greatest differentiators, expertise, and capabilities that Ottawa has to offer the world. As a global tech hub, we have the highest concentration of technology talent per capita in all of North America. Some of our internationally recognized strengths include cybersecurity and telecommunications. 90% of the telecom industry-led R&D that takes place in all of Canada happens right here in Ottawa. We bring all of these capabilities to bear with our industry partners here at AreaX.O. Being in an area that is uh, snowy and the climate is challenging has really uh, been beneficial in, in creating surprises of new technology and how we develop that. That's been quite amazing. For us, coming, coming to this site allows us to do testing in a much more cost-effective way. There are a number of large companies here we can potentially work with to gain a foothold in different industries. And there are a number of smaller innovative companies as well. It's a very collaborative environment. And not only are we being able to talk with people on site, the various companies that are you know, here right now with this, within this footprint, but we're working together on projects to bring across North America to showcase not just our company's technology, but collaborative technologies at work. To have an opportunity to collaborate with such a great organization as Invest Ottawa at their area X.O site, is just fantastic. We're there at the beginning, we get to learn with them, we get to learn with their other partners and collaborators. It's phenomenal. I love innovation, I love technology, and I think that this site is really a model for us being able to have great technology come together. And then I think Ottawa can be a leader in this space um, towards Canada and towards uh, the world. You've got really all of the, um, the ingredients of a triple helix model. You've got government, academia, and industry together. And that to me is exciting. That, that's, that's really why I think the future is very bright with Area X Auto. Okay, fantastic. So um, the, the message there basically is the infrastructure to create all the networking, to continuously make better decisions in a live real time environment in the real world outside of the lab is already there. Um, Diana, when you need to uh, get ready uh, for um, deployments in Alaska, um, I think Kelly did show some part where we are uh, uh, iced over, uh, maybe a, 
false sense of how uh, green we are most of the year in that video. But <laughs> anyway, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Lori Huff. She's Director of Distribution at Hydro Ottawa, um, the uh, nation's capital uh, distribution utility, delivering about two, two gigawatts of energy uh, peak demand um, in, in the summer and the winter uh, peaks. They have the challenge of the grid becoming the gas station uh, for the likes of uh, the transport company. But as Alan pointed out in those uh, stats from FedEx, UPS and others, when those uh, type of uh, organizations completely electrify, um, perhaps a lot earlier than the commercial fleets and the, 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 the uh, stress put on the distribution utility. So over to you, Lori. Thanks, Dev. Yeah, so it's been uh, really interesting to hear from everybody today. I'm not gonna lie, it's a little overwhelming. Uh, just being that kind of last point and the person that everybody's coming to asking for the electricity. And so just hearing these really awesome and ambitious goals that are coming out of uh, the private sector and just what everybody's doing in order to electrify, uh, it's great news. I mean, it's it's definitely the direction I think we need to go uh, as an economy and as a, as a global population. And just hearing uh, Minister McKenna's support and everything that's going on at the federal level and uh, even at the municipal level, uh, it's really great. Um, it's the direction we want to go, but uh, as the last mile, I guess you could say, in the place that everybody goes to to connect, it's a little overwhelming <laughs> to hear where things are going. So, um, and also Area XO, that is really awesome. I love that video, just being able to get a chance to see what's going on right here at home in Ottawa and all the cool innovations that are happening. I mean, Ottawa never ceases to amaze me what we do in technology, so it's pretty great. Uh, so if you go on to the next slide, um, who are we, Hydro Ottawa, for those who are not uh, from the Ottawa region? Uh, we're more than just a local distribution company. Uh, we actually are, uh, we're made up of three different subsidiaries. So Hydro Ottawa being the actual local distribution company and the one that actually provides the electricity to all of the residents of the Ottawa area. Uh, we also have an entity called Portage Power, and it is the uh, Ontario's largest municipally owned producer of green power. Uh, we do run 128 megawatts of renewable generation uh, across 16 hydroelectric facilities generating both in uh, Ontario as well as in upper New York State. Uh, we do have 100% of the water rights on the Shadier Falls uh, as well, which is uh, produced on the Portage, under the Portage Power name. Uh, it is a, an absolutely magnificent uh, thing to see if anybody's never seen the, uh, the Shadier Falls at work and it's Pretty cool. And then we also have uh, Anbari Energy Solutions, and they are uh, a very uniquely positioned energy solution provider, and they're essentially our connection to uh, the outside world in a lot of ways and helping our uh, customers find unique energy solutions to some of the challenges they're seeing, especially as things are uh, evolving. So we really have a great holistic portfolio and a great holistic view of everything that's going on uh, from an electricity perspective within the city of Ottawa. Um, and we're really a, a leader, I would say, um, on the energy space as a result of our unique offering. So uh, on to the next slide, more specifically, uh, who we are as a local distribution company. So we are the third largest municipally owned uh, local distribution company in Ontario. We have over 340,000 customers. Uh, our distribution network is pretty sizable. Um, 91 distribution substations made up of uh, substations owned by Hydro Ottawa and jointly owned with uh, Hydro One Networks, our transmission supplier. Uh, we have 50,000 poles, uh, pretty well an equal distribution of both overhead and underground uh, cables and power lines, and just over 48,000 transformers. Um, pretty large service territory as well. So uh, for us, uh, to the next slide, when you talk about some of the challenges that we're facing right now, one of the main things we're seeing is very large and disruptive load requests coming in. Uh, some of them not as formal load requests right now, but enough to uh, at least start invoking some uh, call for action, I would say, on our part, and a need to change the way that we are uh, taking on customers and just getting an understanding of what's coming down the pipe. Uh, we're seeing the location of customer requests more and more frequently becoming a challenge, uh, depending on the supply voltage in that area and depending on the available capacity. Uh, it can be as simple as we can connect you within 24 hours, well, not 24 hours, but we can connect you pretty quickly, or we're going to have to take months to years to even consider any kind of a way to get uh, customers on. Uh, the charging demand and profile and uh, Alan, your presentation was spot on with the challenges and it's not only a cost perspective, but also it's to help connect the utility and help save the utility some challenges there and 
um, the demand and the time that they're that the, the electricity is being demanded makes a huge difference for us, uh, whether it's on peak time or whether it's spread out. Um, so the more that the charge time can be flattened and that peak can be flattened, obviously, the easier it is for us to connect and solve some of these issues for customers who are coming to us asking for electricity. Uh, and then the current Ontario supply construct is, uh, is an interesting one as well for us, just in the sense that we are, uh, we are owned, uh, so we are operated uh, by a provincial grid. So we do not have a local distribution system operator. It is a provincially operated system. And so in some cases uh, in the city itself, we see some pretty unique challenges in, in pocketed areas. Um, and so we're working closely with the, uh, with the ISO in order to determine and look for new and innovate, innovative ways to uh, solve some of these kind of more local challenges that we have. Um, and so that's, a, that's an interesting one as well. Um, some of the opportunities we have right now and we're facing is uh, some of the things that we need to do is work closely with the city of Ottawa this, itself. Uh, the city of Ottawa, for those who don't know, have an energy evolution initiative, which is an incredibly aggressive initiative to decarbonize the city of Ottawa. Um, with that comes obviously a lot of demand for electricity, um, a lot higher demand for electricity across the, uh, the city. And so we need to make sure that we're tightly aligned with them and that we're um, locked in foot and step to just ensure that we can meet their needs as they come up. Uh, we are actively, uh, need to actively participate and continue to participate with the OEB and the ISO and other local distribution membership groups. We're that point between the customer and the electricity supply. So in a lot of cases, there's regulatory barriers, there's local or there's or more global capacity issues. Um, there's a lot of challenges that are going on in terms of rate structure and stuff. And we know that our customers look to us to be the ones that solve those problems for them. So we need to be ready and available to do that. And we need to really do better at being that go between for our customers. We need to look for non-wires alternatives. We need to understand how we can further adjust that. And we need to start understanding more about what's coming down the pipe. And then, I mean, the, I think the, the, the last piece, it's uh, kind of an overarching is we need to do better at working with companies like Blue Wave to find new and unique ways to solve some of these challenges using data and using analytics and using uh, technology rather than always going to um, that hard lines and wires solution. So that's a, that's a little bit about us in a nutshell and back over to you, Jeff. Thanks, thanks, Lori. So um, just with the time remaining, I'll close off uh, explaining to the audience how Blue Wave ties all of this together. Um, but Lori brought up uh, some key statistics there. And um, uh, for those who aren't in the electricity world, and you know, I kind of joke that we're all propeller heads talking in our own language. Um, she mentioned 91 substations. So you know, if you drive around the city, you see all those gas stations that are out there. Guess what? Those 91 substations are there. You drive by these, uh, you know, what looks like a whole bunch of electricity hardware behind a fence. And it, it says like high voltage, don't step anywhere close to the place. Well, that's, th those are the places that are distributing electricity to all of us. And suddenly a, a, a lot of the, the load, uh, uh, the energy load in terms of moving gas around or, or delivering gas into vehicles, it's going behind those fences. And Lori mentioned that, you know, she's, her category in the industry is stuck with dealing with all of this Silicon Valley IT elect, uh, electrification, and they're they're stuck with this legacy infrastructure that needs to actually support this path. So let me uh, go into the Blue Wave presentation. Uh, if you if, if you move over to the next slide um, and and build it up, we're uh, the blue and Blue Wave. For those who uh, don't know us, is uh, is uh, the, our blue planet and the climate. And the wave is the electricity waves, ideally green electricity waves that uh, electrify our cities and our transportation. Uh, we're founded in 2017, uh, won several industry awards. We have eight USPTO uh, patents filed in this whole area. And our energy, uh, our AI is operating in the real world 24 seven. In both the Canadian and uh, Indian markets, we, we passed our second year uh, with live operations, data coming out of sensors and delivered AI continuously throughout the day. Let's go over to the next slide. So 
I'm uh, uh, we've won several, several industry awards. We were uh, finalists at the Startup Energy Transition Awards run by the German Energy a Agency, won the Smart Grid category at the World Energy Congress and uh, top 20 Canadian emerging companies. Uh, next slide. Now I'll try to answer some of the questions that uh, came up in, in, in the chat box. So the, at the top, you have the generation side. So some people are asking like, you know, you electrify transportation, how do we get more green energy into the vehicles? So the top layer is the generation side, big solar farms, nuclear, coal, and so on. The bottom are the cities. Uh, and that's where Lori fits in. And she's got to support the energy loads. And now increasingly in the bottom right corner, the EV loads. In the middle, there's a transmission grid. So when you drive by the highway, you see all those wires hanging over our heads, uh, delivering energy from A to B. And in between is Blue Wave AI, where we connect up to sensors, to IT systems, to data, look at what's happening in real time and predict, optimize, and send a dispatch on how energy can be used in the grid, more a green energy and not waste it and how electric transportation can use some of that. So we'll go into the next side, slide, which close, closes off. Um, what we do, and there's two parts to this, there's energy being used at a depot and there's energy being used by electric fleets. And there's all this variable data, there's telematics, there's the state of charge in batteries, the equipment status, schedules that people like Diana and Jim have to run in their operations. There's the actual energy that the, the building still needs energy, even if, even if the, the buses need energy, you can't just suddenly turn off the building lights and the building air conditioning and the building computers. And you want to use more uh, locally generated uh, solar energy if, if possible. You might want to buy energy from wind farms and solar farms. You know, Google says when the wind blows and sun shines, our, our data centers are operating. When you're doing your Google search, you're getting it all from clean energy across the wires from Idaho or Wyoming and so forth. And bus companies and transport companies want to do that. And all of this in the context of fluctuating weather and energy prices. And doing this 24 seven, as Alan pointed out, uh, the, the existing operators um, don't have 20 or 30 years of experience to get all of this done. So what they uh, rely on is some intelligence to make better decisions, save 10, 20, 50%, 24 seven. Blue Wave AI ties all of that together and we can engage with you and explain to you how we do that it's all cloud-based, which is a nice uh, approach to connecting up to the sensors and being able to scale out between multiple deployments for guys like Jim uh, with MB who will scale out to multiple cities with different regulatory and pricing environments and different weather and uh, passenger loads. Likewise for an airline scaling from Seattle to Los Angeles, to Maui, to Anchorage. Um, the key is how to use data more intelligently as Minister McKenna pointed out. So with that, I'm gonna close it off. I, I hope I touched on some of the questions. Um, our, uh, our panelists were uh, very animated and, uh, and shared with you way more information than I expected and answered many of the questions we expected them to answer. So what I'm gonna do now is turn it over to uh, Sonia Shori. Uh, VP of Marketing at Invest Ottawa, who has kindly had her team host us, all of us today, to showcase some of the challenges in this industry transition, as well as the opportunities for decarbonization and also wealth, wealth generation. So over to you, Sonia. Thank you so much, Dev. And on behalf of Invest Ottawa, Baby Yards, and Ariex Auto, the future flex of innovation and collaboration, it was an honor to be with you today. Uh, very grateful to Blue Wave, one of the incredible scaling tech companies and clean tech that we support and collaborate with. Minister McKenna, a huge champion for our region and all speakers and participants who joined us today. Within my capacity as the VP of Strategy for AREX.O and Invest Ottawa, I'm incredibly inspired and excited by what we heard today and the potential that it represents. 
We here in Canada's capital, we're excited about supporting entrepreneurs, firms from startups to scale ups to multinationals to help them enable and accelerate their R&D innovation and business goals and to collaborate with the world with many of those on the call today across the US and around the world, helping to open up new market opportunity and is hopeful that our innovations will help to achieve some of the shared goals that we've set, including those related to EV and electrification. Perhaps the greatest takeaway that I have drawn from today's discussion is the tremendous opportunity and impact that can be achieved through multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral collaboration. So many ecosystem-based models were presented today. Of course, Ariax Auto is founded on powerful collaboration. Our ecosystem is truly founded on that same level of partnership. And now I've been inspired by so many models right across North America that were provided today. I believe the brain trust, the examples and the lessons learned that were shared can inspire all of us and help to propel us all forward. And I'm hopeful that perhaps we will all have the opportunity to bring those lessons to bear collaboratively to help achieve even greater progress towards the sustainability goals that we have set. To our friends and neighbors who joined us from across the US, it was a privilege. We really are very passionate about the bilateral collaboration that exists and the many opportunities that lie ahead. On behalf of Invest Ottawa, Ariex.O, together with Blue Wave, we want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us. There is so much to come. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Sonia. My, uh, uh, in closing, I'd just like to send a, a shout out to one of our colleagues who's not on our screen, uh, Marlene Alta, who runs our corporate communication, stick handled and brought this tremendous panel and, and, and brought it live along with your colleagues. Thanks.